Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Tomek Jak. I'm from uh, DHL, and together today with... I'm Keith Tenzer, Principal Solution Architect at Red Hat. Yeah, and I would like to tell you our uh, short, but I think a powerful story about um, using OpenShift in uh, DHL. And yeah, as you can see, making a, making a big yellow fly. Um, DHL is a pretty big company. Uh, it is uh, actually a leading uh, mail uh, um, service in Europe, the biggest one. We have a, a number one supply chain operations. You know, DHL Express, you probably know it. Uh, we are delivering to 220 countries worldwide. And we have also global forwarding uh, in, uh, in air and ocean, also leading, uh, leading services worldwide. So it's a 510,000 people company. And uh, our challenge, or my challenge currently, is how to make it fly. And uh, you know, we have thousands of uh, applications, we have hundreds of technologies, people all over, all over the world, and how to get them, get them be quicker and running. And we have to do it. We have a big, big challenge, uh, because obviously the market we are operating is changing rapidly. Uh, maybe not so much like for banks or uh, insurances, but we also impacted by the digitalization where our competitors are introducing new digital products. Uh, our customers, like Amazon, are becoming our competitors. And so we have a lot of small startups really trying to bite, bite into our business. And yeah, that's, that's our challenge. And that's why uh, in 2016, we kind of started uh, thinking what we do about it from IT perspective and how to really be faster, more flexible, and, and, and fit innovation into uh, you know, this uh, 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 big yellow uh, 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 colors. And our approach, uh, pretty old concept, but good works for us, is uh, introducing uh, or trying to bring the challenge, uh, the, the change uh, via bimodal concept. Uh, because in, in such a big environment, it's just not possible to really come and say like, all right, guys, from, day, from today we are going to be agile and quick and fast, and, uh, and that's, that's not possible in such a big organization to make it. So we said, okay, we do it the bimodal way. Uh, we let the guys in the mode one as they work today, and, we've, and we try to build new capability in the mode two, and then slowly pull everybody into into this uh, new, new approach. And the, the idea was to focus on three areas. Uh, change the technology, that's what we'll be talking in a second a little more in depth, adapting the processes, and, and working on the culture and, uh, and mindsets. And um, in terms of the technology, it was 2016 uh, when we started looking for the right technology, and our uh, choice was we, we wanted to find a container-based platform and uh, we wanted to have a zero downtime platform, and something that is really scalable and set up for a future. And um, in terms, well, the, the, the technology is good, but technology is you know, part of the solution. Uh, you need to adapt all the processes around and uh, really adapt your operating model, uh, automate your deployments, and also uh, introduce some better commercial model or, or on, on, on selling internally the, the technology. And finally, and that's, I've heard from Barclays, the same problem. You know, you've, you're starting with the technology, which is like a first obvious choice. Then you, well, it's a little bit more difficult to get the process around uh, uh, updated. But the most difficult in the end what stays is changing the people's mind. And it's, uh, uh, you know, with containers, you are having so many new concepts uh, about new architecture, about um, new way of developing software, and especially bringing all the teams and people together. That, in the end, st stays to be the most hard part. All right, so this is how we, how we started. That is our why. And, um, uh, well, we ended up uh, implementing uh, an OpenShift uh, uh, as our technology base. And let's, let, let us share with you a little bit some details about it. Well, so th this is a little bit like a big picture of our, our model. So the, the most important is actually that we are not trying just to have an open shift, uh, you know, like a container as a, as a service implemented. What we try to do is to have like an entire end-to-end -end, uh, uh, ecosystem uh, for, for our developers so that when the projects are coming to, to, to our uh, platform, they, they have like a full, full experience. They just need really 
come with the source code and all the rest is set. And let me explain how it is, how it is being done. So at the bottom, we decided uh, to have an on-premise cluster, uh, or at least start with on-premise cluster. And um, advantage of on-premise cluster that you can easily modernize existing applications because they are just on the infrastructure, you know, sitting in the data center next, next to each other. So we have a physical ESX cluster uh, uh, with physical servers uh, as a bottom of, of our uh, OpenShift uh, system. And, and then uh, we have, of course, OpenShift layer. Um, uh, I was personally fighting quite a, long, uh, a lot internally uh, to make uh, an OpenShift cluster being just one cluster. Uh, many people can make different choices, so, you know, splitting tests and production uh, on having one cluster and another. Uh, uh, our, our, uh, we were able to succeed and to persuade people to just have one cluster with everything inside. Uh, but the deal was, um, okay, you can have one cluster, but uh, we still need to, you know, separate production from uh, uh, tests, and th th that we do uh, with, uh, with the um, uh, networking zones. And um, uh, here on the picture, you can see we have actually also two, two zones on the cluster, one internal zone for um, application that um, only connect to the existing data center uh, infrastructure. And we have also in the cluster built a DMZ zone for application that are uh, going to be exposed or, or being connected from internet. Um, so that's, let's say, a, a, a technology base. And uh, what was important for us um, is to put also like a, a, the whole DevOps uh, tool chain, like a standardized devil, the, the DevOps tool chain block on top. And um, practically to give, give the, the, the projects like an end-to-end -end experience. So they just come to the, to the platform and they not just have a place to run containers, but also a place where they have uh, all the tools uh, uh, to do entire deploy deployment chain. And that's, a, that's an important concept to, to change a big company at scale. Um, so um, uh, and that's the power of the platform, um, that you give the people like a stand, as much as possible standardized block, and, and then the projects can very, very quickly uh, jump on this, on this model, and then you are in, you know, scaling up and, and introducing the, ch the change uh, very, very quickly. Yeah, and on our cluster, we have uh, people from all over the places, uh, from all our divisions uh, running their uh, applications, and all mixing on, this, on, on one cluster, and that gives a good, a good, good simplicity in, 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 op in operating it. Okay, and now I switch to, uh, to Keith to talk about uh, a little bit details on our networking and details of our cluster. Oh, thanks. Um, so, as Tomic mentioned, you know, one of the things we did here was we integrated the platform with existing IT, so existing IT infrastructure. And so, anytime you do that, I think one of the biggest areas that's a challenge is on the networking side. People are working with firewall rules and want to do things in a certain way, and there's certain processes. And so, while you want to bring about change and change certain things, it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of trade offs here. And so, we had quite a lot of discussions, actually, um, as you remember, Tomic. Um, on what the best way to do this and the best approach. What we decided to do at the end of the day was not change the way the current IT does networking or firewall rules or, or any of that stuff in regards to the OpenShift platform. Um, so what that meant is we basically have two zones. We have a DM set, as the Barclays guys also mentioned, they have that as well, as most companies that have internet-facing applications are under regulatory rules and require uh, different levels of, of, of security there. And we had, obviously, the internal. And as Tomic mentioned, we have the same uh, cluster, so we're running production and test on the same OpenShift cluster. Um, and so what you see here, um, the top box basically is the management zone. So we created a separate zone for management. And we opened up, obviously, the ports for the master servers so that they can communicate with the nodes in the DM set uh, test and production as well as in uh, the, the internal ones. And um, that's in red, the masters. On, in the middle, you see the, the, in yellow the, 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 manage, uh, the, the monitoring, logging, metrics, all of that stuff. So we have a separate cluster there of nodes for that. And then um, on, 
on the right, you see the, the in purple uh, is basically the, uh, the, the infra nodes. That's basically the OpenShift router, the proxy. So it's taking requests for Kibana, for metrics and logging, um, and that's what it's there. And then on the left, we have obviously an Ansible host for deployment and cloud forms, which Tom, I think, will address a little bit um, about what we're doing with chargeback and how we're using that. Um, so basically, uh, that's opened up. And then I think what's interesting is how we're doing uh, the application traffic. So in each, of these, in each of these zones, there's basically, you'll see two infrastructure nodes. It's, again, running the OpenShift router um, because there's no east-west traffic. So where you see basically these firewalls, there's, there's no, there's no uh, east-west traffic going. There's hard firewalls between that. So an application running in the DM set cannot uh, communicate with anything outside of that unless you open up uh, specific rule sets. And so one of the challenges with, you know, with, with at least the, the, the proxy, um, if you, let's say, just had a proxy that could access all these zones, well then somebody that's accessing a DM set application, DMZ application, could access an application internally potentially. So someone from the internet could potentially do that. And so that's why we created sort of these, 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 these hard set um, zones, if you will. And so this is one way to do that. And so the nice thing here is the firewall rules, at least from how DHL we were viewing it, we don't need to change the way they work. They work exactly the way they do today. They can open up firewall rules and manage access from, uh, from external applications, who has access to what um, with the environment outside of OpenShift, basically. Um, so that's basically what, uh, what, we, what we did there. So I give it back to you, Tommy. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, now, uh, I would like to come back a little bit to the, to the processes uh, because, you know, implementing technically OpenShift cluster, it is, you know, fun for a couple of months, but this is just a beginning of the journey. And the question is, okay, so I have the cluster, but how can I scale? How can I get quicker? And um, uh, one of the points I mentioned already was uh, give them the fast processes and, 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 and uh, enable the, the application build, not just on the, you know, in the container, but really in, in the company and how to make it work. And uh, uh, this is a little, uh, little picture how we uh, uh, connected the OpenShift cluster with our existing toolings. And so we said, all right, instead of like, just giving the people empty, empty cluster and okay, find your container and run in them, give them the entire story. So in our case, we are using our own internal Git repository to keep um, the source code and also configuration. Uh, we are um, managing the entire uh, CI/CD pipeline with our internal Jenkins. Was also a big discussion: shall we do it with Jenkins on on on, um, on OpenShift or an external? And I think the good choice was to use an external uh, to OpenShift uh, uh, our own uh, Jenkins. Uh, for um, uh, in the build process, we uh, use Artifactory to uh, to pull the dependencies. And a big, big advantage for me is uh, that we are using uh, or giving the people the base images uh, uh, the, from, from Red Hat. So we don't have to take care about updating and maintaining uh, images. We're just getting them uh, from Red Hat, and that's, that's a very big advantage of, of, of the OpenShift as a, as a system. In the test, uh, we are using Fortify scan and SonarCube scan. So we want to make really sure that the containers are going on the platform. And you know, we are mixing everybody on the one platform are pretty good quality. So we require people to use Fortify and SonarCube. And uh, we also connect it to the platform uh, Selenium and uh, UFT, Universal Functional Tests, um, uh, so they can do an automated testing. Uh, so in the best case, they, they can kind of run the entire pipeline fully automatic up to production. That's, that's what's possible. And the last piece uh, on the picture, the production, and that's probably maybe the most difficult one, was how to make sure that the change process will be fast like a platform. And, you know, in my world, the, or, you know, no, normal change process, you have a change ticket, you need 20 approvals, you need to, you know, register it 10, uh, 10 or best two weeks uh, before, before the change. So, you know, you know, really like, you know, traditional enterprise change uh, process and how to make it actually not stay in the way. And we were able to uh, create like a fast, a fast uh, change process, and we are using for change tracking and uh, service now system, and we just connected it practically with API. So whenever we deploy to production OpenShift, then we are creating automatically a change ticket, 
and, uh, and through a very disciplined pipeline, we ensured our change, change management colleagues that uh, non, uh, you know, change management rules are compromised. So we are kind of saying we're replacing a manual approvals that used to be or are, are still for non-open sheet systems with uh, automatic approvals build, built in, in the pipeline. And that, that enables uh, the whole system works fast and in such a, uh, uh, let's say, traditional environment like we are, we, we can deploy it you know, at the speed of the project. They can deploy it every five minutes, depends how their pipeline is working. Um, yeah, so that gives the people the entire story. So people just can, you know, applications are just coming with the source code and off we go. Uh, we get them quickly onboarded and then, you know, they are up and running. And that I hope will let us, uh, you know, deploy, uh, well, uh, really bring the change at the scale. Um, one more maybe interesting point for some of you. Uh, well, I'm working for DHL, but IT services, DHL IT services, we are like in a, you know, within the group and a, like IT company within the group. So uh, I, I'm selling the open chip to my own business units. And uh, the idea was, uh, you know, how to sell it. And here's an, a little idea uh, what we, we use. So we wanted to have two things at the same time to sell open chip, you know, and have like a pay per use cloud feeling. And on the, other, on the other side, you know, paper use, if somebody used maybe a cloud a little bit too aggressively, you know, the, the spend on, on paper use can be quite high, you know? You sometimes really you don't know how to control it. So an idea here is to introduce so-called application box. So people buying, you know, like a quota on the cluster, say, I want to have four cores and 16 gig RAM. And within this box, within this physical quota on the cluster, projects can, uh, can deploy uh, and consume this quota as they want. But uh, we will they will never, you know, breach the maximum size of the, of the, of the box, like in example, four cores, that's maximum. And on the other side, to make sure that the people properly sizing and buying a proper, proper uh, boxes, we charge them a, a minimum charge always of 20%. So don't, don't get crazy, you know, they come and say like, okay, give me 1,000 cores because it's paper use, right? And, and you know, use two cores and, you know, I, doesn't make any sense from capacity management. And yeah, and actually they are then being charged physically between minimum charge and the, and the maximum charge of, you know, represented in this, in this box. So that's an idea that might some, uh, if they're in a similar situation, need to resell the open chip to our, your internal customers or external customers, that's maybe an interesting idea. And yeah, the final two uh, words on our outlook. So it's, uh, you know, we are relatively fresh guys on the block. Uh, uh, so what do we want to now, uh, how we want to expand is uh, we will be building another cluster, uh, kind of multi-cluster environment. That's one of our expansion. We would, uh, we are just implementing a persistent storage as we, as we speak. And we think about uh, uh, putting a disaster recovery, multi-cluster disaster recovery scenarios. We have uh, uh, some concept ready. And I think in next year, I hope to persuade my internal stakeholders that we get with another cluster on cloud and really run some uh, 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 hybrid scenarios. So if some of you, and I saw already some of you are already doing the, that kind of stuff, then you know, catch me on, <laughs> on the break and uh, give me some good feedback uh, because we are here to learn from each other. So that's our, our little outlook. Yeah, and with that, I think we are coming to the end. So thank you very much for listening. And maybe there's a question.